Are you familiar with the concept of experiencing both abundance and loss within a single day? I certainly am. I am currently employed and I have a personal account to share. I used to be the wealthiest individual in the entire eastern region, residing in the land of O. My possessions included 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pairs of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a team of servants at my command. Additionally, I was blessed with seven sons and three daughters. I held a deep reverence for God and avoided all forms of evil. Whenever my sons hosted feasts at their homes and invited their sisters to join them for food and drink, I made it a point to ensure their purity by conducting early morning rituals and offering burnt sacrifices on their behalf. My intention was to address any sins they may have committed or any potential blasphemy against God lingering in their hearts. However, on a specific day while my sons and daughters were indulging in merriment and wine at the house of my eldest son, a messenger arrived with distressing news. The oxen were plowing in the vicinity, and the donkeys were grazing nearby when a group of raiders known as the Sabians attacked. They seized the animals, killed the servants attending to them, and I, miraculously, managed to escape to relay this unfortunate event to you. While the messenger was still delivering this devastating account, another individual arrived with equally dreadful tidings. They informed me that a fire, seemingly sent by God from the heavens, had engulfed and consumed all my sheep, along with the accompanying servants. Once again, I was the lone survivor who could share this tragic tale. And before the second messenger had even finished speaking, a third messenger arrived, bearing news of the Chaldeans forming three marauding parties that targeted my camels. They captured the animals, slaughtered the servants, and once again I was the solitary survivor entrusted with the task of informing you. Regrettably, the series of calamities did not end there. Another messenger approached, disclosing that while my sons and daughters were engrossed in revelry and wine at my eldest son's abode, a mighty wind suddenly arose from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, causing it to collapse upon them. Tragically, they all perished, and for the fourth time, I alone survived to recount this heart-wrenching incident to you. Overwhelmed by grief and disbelief, I was shattered. I tore my robe, shaved my head, and prostrated myself on the ground, moaning and enduring immense suffering. My worst fears had become a reality. In my anguish, I even took a broken piece of pottery and scraped myself with it while sitting among the ashes. It was at this point that my own wife approached me and questioned whether I still maintained my integrity. She suggested that I curse God and end my life. These were the very words uttered by my beloved wife. In response, I rebuked her, remarking that she spoke like a foolish woman. I questioned whether it was appropriate for us to accept only blessings from God and not endure any hardships. Throughout this ordeal, I refrained from blaming God for causing evil, and I did not sin in my words or actions. Upon hearing of the immense tribulations I had endured, my friends Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar departed from their homes and gathered together with the intention of offering me comfort and solidarity. The three individuals were older than me, and when they spotted me from a distance, they could barely recognize me. Their immediate reaction was to weep loudly, tear their garments, and sprinkle dust over their heads as a sign of mourning. Subsequently, they joined me on the ground, where we sat together for seven consecutive days and nights. During this time, no one uttered a single word to me, as they could perceive the immense suffering I was enduring. Finally, I broke the silence and expressed my anguish by cursing the day of my birth. I exclaimed that the day I was born should be obliterated, and the night that announced my conception should be transformed into darkness. I wished for God above to disregard that day, and for no light to ever shine upon it. I began questioning the purpose of life itself. Why is life bestowed upon those engulfed in misery, and given to those whose souls are embittered? Why do individuals yearn for death, yet it eludes them like hidden treasure? And why do they rejoice when they finally reach the grave? What purpose does life serve for a man whose path is concealed and whose journey is restricted by God? Furthermore, I lamented about the deterioration of my existence. 
My daily sustenance became nothing but sighs, and my anguish poured forth like water. The very things I feared and dreaded had befallen me. Restlessness and turmoil replaced peace and tranquility in my life. I felt shattered in spirit, and my days seemed to be dwindling. The grave awaited me as mockers surrounded me, subjecting me to their hostility. In my despair, I turned to prayer and pleaded with God to provide me with the assurance He demanded. I questioned if anyone else would be willing to vouch for my integrity. Sorrow had dimmed my eyes, and my physical being had withered away, resembling a mere shadow. I acknowledged that my days were futile, and my plans lay in ruins. During my suffering, my three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, attempted to console me, as friends often do. They aimed to strengthen me in my affliction. However, they also offered their opinions on the matter at hand. They delved into the topic of why God permits human suffering and concluded that I must be undergoing such tribulations due to some wrongdoing on my part. Consequently, they persistently urged me to admit my supposed transgressions and repent in the hope that God would restore His blessings upon me. Eliphaz went further to assert that my pain must be a direct result of a specific sin I had committed. He advised me to seek God's favor as a means of finding resolution. Bildad and Zophar shared similar perspectives, believing that my suffering was a consequence of provoking God's justice through my perceived evil deeds. They encouraged me to exhibit more innocent behavior to alleviate my afflictions. Bildad even suggested that my own children might have brought death upon themselves through their actions. To make matters worse, Zophar responded skeptically, questioning the validity of all my words. He wondered if my words would go unanswered or if my arguments would be justified. He challenged the notion that my empty words could silence others, and he insinuated that I should expect rebuke rather than support. When you mock, you assert to God that your beliefs are faultless and you are pure in His eyes. Oh, how I wish that God would respond, that He would open His lips against you and unveil the depths of wisdom. True wisdom encompasses different aspects. Know this, God has even overlooked some of your sins. Surely He recognizes those who deceive, and when He witnesses evil, does He not take notice? But if you wholeheartedly turn to Him, extending your hands in surrender, if you rid yourself of the sin that lingers in your grasp and refuse to allow evil to dwell in your midst, then you will be free from guilt. You will lift up your face with confidence, standing firm and unafraid. You will forget your afflictions, remembering them only as waters that have passed by. They presumed that my troubles were a clear indication of God's judgment upon me. However, I feared God and shunned evil. At one point I grew weary of their words. I addressed them, saying, Undoubtedly you believe that you alone possess wisdom, and wisdom will perish with you. But I too possess understanding. I am not inferior to you. I am acquainted with all these matters. I have become a subject of ridicule among my friends, despite my righteous and blameless ways. Even though I called upon God and He answered me, I am regarded as a mere object of mockery. Yet, I desire to speak directly to the Almighty and present my case before God. However, you slander me with lies, acting as worthless physicians. If only you would remain silent, for that would be true wisdom. Listen now to my argument. Pay heed to the pleas that escape my lips. Are you speaking wickedly on behalf of God? Are you deceitfully advocating for Him? Are you showing partiality in His favor? Will you argue God's case? Would it fare well for you if He were to scrutinize your actions? Could you deceive Him as easily as you deceive a mortal? Surely He would hold you accountable if you secretly displayed favoritism. Would not His splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of Him fall upon you? Even though He may bring calamity upon me, I will still place my hope in Him. I am determined to defend my ways before His face. Indeed, this will lead to my deliverance for no wicked person would dare to stand before him. Now that I have presented my case, I am confident that I will be vindicated. Can anyone bring charges against me? If so, I will remain silent and accept death. Just grant me these two requests, O God, and I will no longer hide from you. 
Remove your hand from me and cease to frighten me with your terrors. Then summon me, and I will answer, or allow me to speak, and you can reply to me. How many wrongs and sins have I committed? I am ready to confront God and address them all. I would beseech Him to reveal to me my transgressions and sins. God, why do you conceal your face and perceive me as your adversary? You bind my feet with shackles and meticulously observe all my paths, leaving marks on the soles of my feet. The weight of suffering has overwhelmed me, and now I am bitter, anxious, and fearful. I denounce the injustice of a God who allows the wicked to prosper while many honest individuals, including myself, endure suffering. I yearn to confront God and voice my protest, but I cannot physically find Him. I declared to my friends, as surely as God lives who has denied me justice, the Almighty has embittered my existence. As long as I have life within me and the breath of God in my nostrils, I will not utter wicked words with my lips, nor will I speak lies with my tongue. I will never concede that you are right until the day I die. I will not renounce my integrity. I will uphold my innocence and never yield it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Eventually, the Lord intervenes, but it is exceedingly difficult to defend oneself in such misery. What was my greatest anguish? It encompassed physical pain as I was covered in sores from head to toe, weary, exhausted, and enduring excruciating agony. Additionally, my pain was social in nature, stemming from my physical appearance and the fact that the local community was well aware of my recent tragedy. I became an outcast, with people passing by on the other side of the street, avoiding any interaction with me as I sat on the ash heap at the outskirts of the village. Even teenagers mocked me. Furthermore, my pain was mental, grappling with the torment of not understanding why these distressing events befell me, particularly when there seemed to be no indications in my past pointing to such suffering. Lastly, my pain extended to the spiritual realm, where my anguish of feeling separated from God surpassed all others. The agony of suffering intensifies when we believe that God is distant and indifferent. However, when I finally obtained the opportunity to speak with God, things did not unfold as anticipated. During my numerous speeches, I implored God to engage in conversation with me. Now my wish was granted, and the Lord spoke to me. He posed the question, who is this that obscures my plans with words lacking knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. He proceeded to ask where I was when he laid the foundations of the earth, inviting me to comprehend if I possessed such understanding. Who determined its dimensions? Surely I should know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy, who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, who adorned the clouds as its garment, enveloping them in thick darkness, who established its boundaries and placed its doors and bars. When I declared, This far you may come, and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever commanded the morning or shown the dawn its place? Can you shake the wicked out of the earth as it takes shape like clay under a seal? with its features standing out like those of a garment? Can anyone who contends with the Almighty correct him? Can one who accuses God answer him? I, in response, acknowledged my unworthiness and covered my mouth with my hand. I spoke once, but I have no answer, twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke, questioning if I would discredit his justice and condemn him to justify myself. He asked if I possessed an arm like God's, and if my voice could thunder like his. He urged me to clothe myself with glory and splendor and unleash the fury of my wrath, to bring down the proud and humble them, to crush the wicked and bury them in the dust, shrouding their faces in the grave. Only then would I admit that my own right hand could save me. The Lord drew attention to the behemoth, a creature made by him, which feeds on grass like an ox. Its strength lies in its loins, and power resides in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar, and its thighs are tightly knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze, and its limbs are like rods of iron. It stands as a remarkable creation of God, 
yet even its maker can approach it with a sword. The hills bring forth its produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. It lies hidden under the lotus plants in the marsh, concealed by their shadows. The poplars by the stream surround it. Even as a river rages, it remains secure. Though the Jordan surges against its mouth, no one can capture it by the eyes or trap it by piercing its nose. Overwhelmed, I fell to the ground and acknowledged that God can do all things, and no purpose of His can be thwarted. I had spoken of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. God instructed me to listen as He spoke, questioning me and demanding answers. My ears had heard of Him, but now my eyes had seen Him. Therefore, I despised myself and repented in dust and ashes. The Lord commanded my friends to offer a burnt offering and instructed me to pray for them because He was angry with them for speaking untruthfully about Him. Both times God spoke to me, it was during a storm. He reminded me of His role as the Creator of everything, reviewing His incredible activity in creating and sustaining the world. He questioned whether I could match His work. The Lord concluded by asserting that it was presumptuous for me to expect Him to explain Himself to me. As a servant of God, I felt insignificant. I was justified, while my three friends were severely punished by God. The Lord declared that they had not spoken accurately about Him. The remarkable aspect of these two conversations with God was that He still did not answer my questions. I prayed for my friends, and the Lord restored my fortunes, granting me double of what I had before. My brothers, sisters, and acquaintances came to my house, comforting and consoling me, each presenting me with a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of my life even more than the first. I possessed 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. I hope you have gained an understanding of this story. May God bless your life. If you have not yet accepted Jesus as your Savior, there is still time. Please share your opinions respectfully in the comment section. If you enjoyed the video, remember to like and subscribe to the channel.